Good morning. The Lord be with you. As we always, let's begin with prayer. God, thank you for this day. May we receive from you all that comes in it. May we understand and feel that you are with us through everything. Uh, may your holy presence guide our thinking, our speaking, our silence. And we ask for your guidance as we study this last chapter of the book of Ruth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so we will finish the book of Ruth today. Uh, the Monday study group uh, meeting in person in Coopville at the Pacific Rim Institute for Environmental Stewardship. Uh, had a good discussion. I, again, completely surprised that we spent four sessions on this story. Uh, but it has engaged people in a way that almost none of our other studies have. I don't know why, particularly. Uh, we did lots of speculation about that. Maybe it's the sheer humanness of the story that we could see ourselves in it in some way, uh, imagine ourselves into the situation, wonder about the different customs and relationships and how that all worked out and what kind of intrigue there was and what kind of planning there was and... Uh, how the rules all worked. Um, all of that comes into play, much of it in our own imaginations as we study the book of Ruth. So here in chapter 4, we have come to the point where Boaz, having accepted a relationship with Ruth that he promises to act as the kinsman redeemer for her and Naomi, to redeem the name of Elimelech, Naomi's dead husband, and Malan, Ruth's dead husband. Remember that Orpah, the other, the other daughter-in-law of Naomi, has gone back to Moab, and her husband, Killian, also died, one of Naomi's sons. And so now we're at the place where Boaz is going to take action to solve the issue of Naomi's inheritance and Elimelech's name. All of that comes into play here as we begin chapter 4. So Boaz goes up to the gate in the city and that's where all the important decisions in town are made. There is no court building, there is no community center as such, that uh, building where people gather to make decisions for the community. Uh, that is done at the gate and normally by the elders. My reading of the background here leads me to think that it's the elders who make decisions about what we would call civil law, things about property and damages and other things that uh, come into play uh, in normally normal day-to-day -day living in a community and relationships among people and land and property and, and buildings and so forth. Uh, there were judges to handle criminal law cases, more serious criminal law cases, but here at the gate of the city, the elders come to make decisions about civil law matters for the community. And Boaz knows that, and so he goes to the gate. And it just so happens, as the text puts it, that the next of kin comes passing by. Uh, this is our narrator's subtle way of telling us that God is orchestrating the events in this story and just what needs to happen, happens. And Boaz catches the eye of this uh, friend, a kinsman nearer to Elimelech than he, Boaz, is, catches his eye and says, come over, friend, and sit down here. And he goes and sits down. And Boaz takes ten men of the elders of the city and said, you also sit down here. And so they did. And then the, the deal or the negotiation uh, 
the legal matter begins. And Boaz tells them why he has called them together and to have them sit down. And he describes the situation this way at first. He says to the next of kin, who is never named, uh, Peloni Almoni is what the text calls him. Mr. So-and-so uh, would be a reasonable way to put that, uh, those Hebrew words. Uh, sit down here, friend, and I will tell you what the situation is. And he said to the next of kin, in the presence, though, of all the elders and others who had gathered at the gate, it's all about Naomi. And we've wondered about that, why the book is called the Book of Ruth, when a good bit of the story centers around Naomi, and it begins with her and all her losses in the opening chapter, and her return to Bethlehem, and her mourning over her bitterness, uh, and her loss of everything that mattered to her except Ruth. And we'll come back to that in the end. Uh, as to maybe why the story is called the book of Ruth rather than the book of Naomi. But Boaz starts with Naomi. Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman Elimelech. Well, it's been 10 years, and somebody's likely been using that land. It can't be legally sold because it doesn't belong to anybody in town. Uh, it belongs to Elimelech or Elimelech's children, Malin or Killian. Uh, and so it's been probably, we don't know for sure, but used by somebody. But now Naomi, who is the wife of Elimelech, who has died back in Moab, Naomi, wants to sell the land that belonged to her husband, our kinsman, our relative, Elimelech. So Boaz says to Mr. So-and-so, I thought I would tell you about this and say to you, why don't you buy it in the presence of all who are sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people who will make a decision about this. And if you decide to redeem it, to buy it, to save the name of Elimelech and Naomi, if you decide to redeem it, then do so, redeem it. But if you won't, let me know so that I can know and there is no one prior to you to redeem it and I come after you. So I will have the next opportunity if you decide not to. And so Mr. So-and-so says, cool, I will redeem it. I'll do it. Sounds good to me. Boaz said, well, there's complication. Let me inform you about that. Also, the day you acquire that field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead man Malin in order to maintain the dead man's name on that inheritance. That means, as I understand it, that if Mr. So-and-so should agree to buy this land, he also is acquiring Ruth, and any children that Ruth would have would be the children of Malin, the dead husband of Ruth. They would not be the children of Mr. So-and-so and Ruth, but they would be the children of Malin to maintain the inheritance of Elimelech's name through Malin and on to whatever children Ruth would have. In other words, Mr. So-and-so would lose the land he's going to buy because it the title of that land belongs to Elimelech's family and to Malin and through Malin to Ruth and any children that Ruth would have. And so that's a complication that would mess with Mr. So-and-so's inheritance. He doesn't want any complications about who gets what 
in his family and in the estate that his family would pass on to his children. And so he says so. Uh, he says that this is a problem, uh, given what Boaz has just said. And so the next of kin, Mr. So-and-so, says, Oh, I cannot redeem it then for myself without damaging my own inheritance. So take my right of redemption yourself. I, I can't redeem it. It, it would be a complication that um, I don't want to have uh, when it comes to having to give the land back to any children that Ruth and I would have uh, because they would be Malin's inheritance and he would have ownership of that land. At least that's how I understand it. Feel free to disagree and to read your commentary to see what point of view your commentary takes as to why Mr. So-and-so decides not to redeem the land. Some people think it's because uh, Ruth is an outsider and he doesn't want the shame of having a foreign wife uh, to deal with. Um, that's possible because of the Ezra and Nehemiah rules about Israelites who have married foreign wives having to divorce them and send them away that we read about in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Some people have speculated that Mr. So-and-so doesn't want that shame, uh, that dishonor of having a foreign wife. But I think the reasons given here have to do with harming his own inheritance rather than with uh, any honor and shame code that may be in the background. So he tells Boaz, in front of all the people that have gathered at the gate, to take his right of redemption yourself, Boaz. I cannot redeem it. So then we learn that there was an old custom in Israel in former times, and this is not former times, this is later times. We don't really know for sure what the later times was when this book and the story that it contains was written. It does exist in the canon between Judges and 1 Samuel. That is between the time of the Judges and when there began to be kings in Israel. So it's in an interim period. And at least the narrator is saying in the period of the Judges and before that, <clears throat> in the times of the 12 tribes, it was the custom that when you were confirming some kind of legal transaction or exchange in the redeeming of property, you would confirm the, uh, the transaction by taking off one of your sandals and giving it to the other person. And so Mr. So-and-so, who's never named, just called the next of kin, says to Boaz, Acquire it for yourself. And he, Mr. So-and-so, took off his sandal and gave it to Boaz. Now, we don't know if he got the sandal back, and this was just a symbolic gesture, or if he walked home on one sandal, or if Boaz took the sandal he received and framed it, put it up on a wall in his house as legal evidence that he had acquired the inheritance that he had redeemed the inheritance of Naomi and Elimelech and acquired Ruth as his wife. We don't know for sure what happened to the sandal. But we do know that Mr. So-and-so gives his sandal to Boaz as evidence that he has given up his right to the land. And so Boaz says to the elders, particularly, but to all the people who were there as well, okay, you all, you see this. It is a legal transaction. The correct thing has been done. I've explained the situation. And Mr. So-and-so has decided not to redeem Naomi and her property and Ruth. 
and I'm going to do so. I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, the land and the people, and all that belonged to his two sons, Killian and Malin. I'm taking responsibility for that. And that includes Ruth, the Moabite, the wife of Malin, who will be my wife to, in order to maintain the dead man's name, that is, Malin's name, who inherit, would have inherited the property from his father, Elimelech. So Boaz says Ruth will be his wife to maintain Malin's name on his inheritance in order that the name of the dead might not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. So these rights of inheritance of property passing down in the same family are being honored in the speech of Boaz and in the transaction that's happening at the gate of Bethlehem. And all the people who were there at the gate, along with the elders, say, yes, we are witnesses. We won't forget this. No one signs anything. Everything is done in an oral culture, is remembered, and there are people who can tell you, yes, this is what actually happened. No, this, that's why you have 10 people. No, somebody might forget it, but 10 people won't. It's been certified by the witnesses. And the elders and the people say, may the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house <clears throat> like the wives of Jacob, Rachel and Leah, who produced the 12 sons of the 12 tribes of Israel, who together built up the house of Israel. And of course, Jacob's name is changed to Israel. So it could be a double reference here to Jacob himself or to the whole people of Israel. And the elders and the people at the gate continue their blessing. May you produce children in this region, in Ephrata, and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give you, notice it's God who's going to produce these children. The human actors do their part but it's God who will give the children to you by this young woman. So may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. And that's another very interesting part of the story, uh, which why would the narrator mention that? Well, Tamar or Tamar is an outsider also. She's a Canaanite woman who seduced Judah. Remember that story back in Genesis. She seduced Judah, who did not make his son to take Tamar as his wife when that brother's wife died. And so because there was a breaking of the law, Tamar, the outsider, found a way to maintain the law of Israel by seducing her father-in-law and by him having twins, Perez and Zerah. And Perez became the father of a line that will eventually come down to Boaz and the child that Boaz and Ruth will have called Obed. But why is Tamar mentioned? She's mentioned because she's like Ruth. She's an outsider. She's also like Rahab, who is not mentioned in this genealogy at the end of the chapter, though Rahab is mentioned along with Ruth and Tamar, all three outsiders, 
all three foreigners, all three marginalized people and women who normally would not be included in a genealogy. They show that God intends to include everyone, women and men, foreigners and his own people, Israel, in his covenant relationship. God is a God of care and compassion for all the people. And specifically then, our author, our narrator mentions when he wouldn't have to, the house of Perez whom Tamar bore to Judah. If you don't remember that story, it's an intriguing one. Go back and read it uh, because Tamar keeps proof that she has slept with Judah and confronts him in order that he might do what he is obligated to do under Israel law. So this book of Ruth ends with Boaz taking Ruth and she became his wife. And when they came together, the Lord made her conceive and she bore a son. All children in Israel society are considered to be gifts of God. God gave Ruth and Boaz a son. And this then causes the women of Bethlehem, who function in some ways like a Greek chorus in this book of Ruth, they come into the narrative at some points to mainly talk to Naomi about stuff. But here they show up in the narrative after the birth of Naomi and Boaz's son. They say to Naomi, not to Ruth, but to Naomi, with whom this story started back in Moab when her husband and her sons all die and she decides to go back from Moab to Bethlehem and R Ruth decides to accompany her and to help her and to be loyal to her and to show her covenant love, even though she's a foreigner and an outsider. The women say to Naomi, now they're going to give a blessing just like the elders and people at the gate blessed Boaz. Now the women are going to speak a blessing. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you, Naomi, this day without a kinsman redeemer. May his name, Boaz's name, be renowned in Israel. May he, Boaz, be to you as a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, that is Ruth, Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, after whom this whole book is named, is more to you than seven sons has borne him. So the has borne him clause goes with uh, who loves you and has borne for you this uh, child in your old age. Who, But Ruth is worth, Ruth the woman is worth more than seven men, is what the women say at the end of this story. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave this child a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. Now, it's not Naomi's son. It wasn't born to Naomi. But it's being considered as if it were Naomi's own son because she was the wife of Elimelech, and through Elimelech, she had two sons, and now she has a grandson. Uh, but the women consider this baby to be, as it were, a son of Naomi, and they name him Obed. Obed means servant, though it comes from the Ebed word in Hebrew that means servant. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse. And Jesse became the father of David, the king. And so now the book ends with a climax. 
Some people argue that this whole book has been heading to this genealogy at the end, that it's not just tacked on, that it's the conclusion because it reaches its pinnacle at the end of this genealogy. Now, the descendants of Perez, Perez, who was the son of the outsider Tamar and of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, Perez became the father of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Aminadab, Aminadab of Nashon, Nashon of Salmon, Salmon of Boaz, Boaz of Obed. Obed will give birth to Jesse, the father of David, the king, the messianic ideal as he became in ancient Israel and for the early Christians as well. Solomon, uh, Solomon was the, in this genealogy, was the husband of Rahab the harlot, the Jericho woman who helped the spies. So Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, which begins with the genealogy of Jesus, has all three of these outsider women, all of whom would not be seen by the women of Israel as ideal, moral people, and especially being foreigners and outsiders, but God includes them. Ruth, Tamar, and Rahab, my commentary in my study Bible says, are given an everlasting name as mothers of the messianic line of kings. The point is not to discredit David mentioning these foreign women outsiders, but to emphasize the grace of God which is offered before any human action or worthiness. God simply gives God's grace to these people whether we would consider them worthy or not. God chooses to use those people who seem unqualified according to normal human standards of judgment in order to accomplish God's purposes in the world. And I add to that, and so there's hope for us too as recipients of God's grace, God's goodness to us and God's using us to accomplish God's purposes does not depend on our holiness, does not depend on our worthiness. We are loved and forgiven by God through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the commentaries that I've been using, Michael Moore's commentary on Book of Ruth, uh, says a couple of things uh, that I thought were worthy to uh, mention here at the end of our study. Why is the book called the Book of Ruth rather than called the Book of Naomi? Well, as the book ends, whatever roles Boaz, Yahweh, and Naomi might play in this drama, Moore says, Ruth is ultimately the person responsible for giving birth to Obed. In this sense, it's Ruth who's the hero of the story, the person ultimately responsible for bringing order out of the chaos with which this book began. Without Ruth's willingness to love and stay with Naomi, without her willingness to leave her homeland behind, without her willingness to humble herself and beg publicly in the fields to glean grain to feed Naomi and herself, without her willingness to beg publicly, without her willingness to obey Naomi and approach Boaz, there would be no celebration here at the end of the book. Ruth gives Israel much more than a fertile womb. Ruth's life challenges the corrupt values of this culture. In Ruth's world, in Ruth's world, women are more expendable than men. Consider the ending of the book of Judges, for example. Yet this woman, Ruth, proves that a destitute foreign widow 
can be of far more value to the people of Israel than seven of its finest sons. I liked how Moore described the ending of this book and why it's justified uh, to call this book the Book of Ruth. We now move on to a study of Esther, and I'll say just a word about that. The Book of Esther comes to us in two primary forms. The, the form found in the Hebrew text, which is in the canon of scripture of most all Protestant Bibles. It uh, comes uh, after uh, it comes after Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and those books come after the books of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, then Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. These are in books that are considered a part of the third section of the Old Testament canon called the Writings. And the book of Esther is still read uh, thousands of years later uh, at the festival of Purim in the Hebrew, in the Jewish calendar. The Hebrew form of the book, the oldest form of the book, is the book is the way the book is in the Protestant canon of Scripture. If you have an NRSV Bible or an NIV translation or a New American Standard Version, uh, the standard Bibles in all Protestant churches contain the Hebrew form of Esther. But Catholic Bibles not only contain the Hebrew form of Esther, they contain the additions to Esther, which were added in the in the first or second century BC, that late, uh, and which expand the story by some 150 verses and fill in what's not mentioned in the book of Esther according to the way that the rabbis wanted the story of Esther to be told. And so these additions to Esther add a theological, spiritual perspective that the book of Esther itself does not have. The Hebrew text of Esther never mentions the name of God. And so it was uh, having a difficult time becoming part of the canon of the Hebrew Bible. It was one of the last books to be included in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, it does not appear among the Dead Sea Scrolls, apparently. The only book of the Old Testament not appearing among the Dead Sea Scrolls, as I understand it. So, uh, the earliest Christians read the book of Esther in the Septuagint. They read the Greek translation, and they read the larger book of Esther. And if you have it, you may want to read it as well. If you have the Apocrypha, it's in the Apocrypha. Uh, if you don't have one, you can find it easily online. Just Google additions, additions to Esther, and you'll find it in various translations um, on the Internet. But we'll be primarily focusing on the Hebrew text, the shorter text of Esther and that story. And I will send out study questions this week about uh, for the first couple of chapters of Esther. Um, I can't imagine and my imagination has failed in the past, as it did with the study of Ruth, where I couldn't imagine we'd take more than two sessions with this book, but we took four. I can't imagine that we'll take nine or ten sessions on Esther. It's just not going to happen, according to me. But according to the Monday study group that is really in charge, uh, it may take more than that. But it's a story. It is a story that needs to be read straight through, and so I would urge you to take half an hour, that's all, half an hour, and read straight through Esther in the Hebrew translation in your basic Old Testament. And if you want to, you can add another half an hour and or 15 minutes and read the additions to Esther. It's just 150 verses, easily to go through, shorter than Psalm 119. So do that before next time. Read the story. And then I will uh, tomorrow probably send out study questions on the first 
two or three chapters of Esther um, so that we can get started in the story. It would not surprise me if we decide to do this whole book in just two or three sessions. Uh, but I, I think given the past history, it won't be just one. All right, thank you. Have a great week. Continue to celebrate the re resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by yourself living a resurrection life. God be with you.